A long time ago, I made a list. 10 wrestlers that seduced your dad. And look, I'm not saying that list did badly. I'm saying that Ollie says that list did badly. And as swiftly as my creative control was given, it was taken away again. You know what? Yeah, okay. But thankfully, he's getting forgetful in his old age. Actually, he's bafflingly a year younger than me. I know, right? And when I asked him what I should do this week's list about, he said, you choose. Well, here comes incredibly niche wrestling list number two, Electric Boogaloo. And I swear to Jesus, you gutless dick better actually watch this one. Beyond that, what more introduction do you need? These matches feature on way too many of my lists, and I'm sick of talking about them very, very, very much. List making is an occasionally joyful art, not when these guys are around. I'm Adam from Parts of Unknown. Here are 10 matches Adam really wants to stop making lists about. Number 10, The Fiend vs. Seth Rollins Hell in a Cell 2019. Tell you one of the worst things about WWE insisting upon stipulation pay-per-views is that every single year after write about three lists featuring this smack-ass lobster bollocks that's redder than a dog's cock and only slightly less welcome in my eye line. I've run out of words to describe WWE's treatment of The Fiend. At least the Mania match with Orton or the Saudi match with Whoopi Billberg won't necessarily crop up every year of my life until I'm dead. What more is there to say? The Hell in a Cell match ends via the ref turning the car around and there was no Cape Canaveral for anybody. They roughhoused too much in the roughhousing match. For fans, it was a whole bunch of final straws for Seth's obnoxious title run that had been ruined by him bragging about his salary so much on Twitter, for WWE's endless clipping of Bray's wings, for them not giving a crap about their own rules and thinking we don't either, for nothing ever mattering, nothing ever mattering. Like the Sartre play, Hell in a Cell also has no exit, and Hell is other people, and that people is Vince McMahon. Hey, speaking of him, number nine, the Royal Rumble match, Royal Rumble 2005. A cat walks into a library, walks up to the head library, librarian and asks, can I have some tuna? The librarian responds, this is a library, and the cat says, oh sorry, can I have some tuna? Now that is a joke. That is a funny joke. Now I will tell that joke again. A cat walks into a library, walks up to the head librarian and asks, can I have some tuna? The librarian responds, this is a library, and the cat says, oh sorry, can I have some tuna. That is what the end of the Royal Rumble 2005 is to me. A funny joke on its first telling because Vince tears both quads and it's very funny. And then I have to mention it every January or anytime the word accident appears in a list title and trying to come up with different ways to tell the same joke endlessly forever is a good way to develop a rash on the brain. And hey, speaking of 2005, number eight, the end of One Night Stand 2005. Look, I've been very good about this one. For almost the entirety of my time writing lists for WrestleTalk and Parts for Unknown, I've barely mentioned that a one night stand 2005 jbl beat up the blue meanie for real in the big brawl to end the show it still haunts me while at what culture i genuinely think this incident made it into something like 20 lists times wrestling got real injuries things to forget about jbl ecw memories things that are unplanned an endless conveyor belt of this one anecdote a stark and brutal reminder that all the wrestling list writers on the internet basically got together chose about 20 things to remember and that those things like a filled tortilla will be chopped and rearranged arranged and folded and called different things despite being the same thing forever. Is this list the equivalent of me trying to escape a prison by setting fire to the prison? Would that work? Asking for a me. Number seven, The Rock versus Steve Austin, WrestleMania X7. You heard me. It doesn't have to be just bad matches on this list. Even one of the greatest matches of all time can go incredibly tiresome to talk about when you do it all the time. This match covers almost the entire gamut of broad wrestling topics. Mania lists, great matches lists, Attitude Era lists, worst booking lists, business milestone lists, all the words written and spoken in an endless loop that swirls around that particular iconic handshake like a whirlpool, sucking thought, feeling, nostalgia into it like a bottomless pit. The moment that a cherished hobby peaked and pivoted downwards, never again to reach those heights. Your hobby never again to justify itself in quite the same way. Your youth to never return. And yet, despite wanting to move on from WrestleMania X7, we are, like boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. Number six, John Cena versus The Miz, WrestleMania 27. Picture the scene. 
It's March. The world teeters on the edge of spring. The days are lengthening. The chill in the air dances on your skin through the sunlight. It's the window of wearing good jackets. Also, it's WrestleMania season, which means that the internet is alive with the sound of plans. The engagement is through the roof. The wrestling fans are only shop once a year and nosing around your market stall. If you're Ollie Davis, this means you spend 18 hour a days wanking into a pool of liquid gold, wanking with both fists wrapped in 50 pound notes. If you're me, this means you write weak weekly lists about WrestleMania, which means inevitably having to talk about the goddamn laptop match. Look, there are worse ways to make a living. I could be head of the tourist advisory board for Plymouth, or I could be Pete. But having an annual tradition of watching The Miz main event WrestleMania and win does feel like it's up there. Number five, Hulk Hogan versus Yokozuna WrestleMania 9. Even when the Hulkster eventually jobs to the Grim Reaper and you can bet he won't job clean, his legacy will live on in a thousand documentaries, endless parades of moments and countless articles and lists and discourse about professional wrestling because for the better part of 20 years, he was professional wrestling. All of its triumphs, all of its successes, all of its tedious bollocks, the pomp, the politics, and he is the figurehead for the industry at both ends of those extremes. An icon and a cautionary tale, a tale told over and over and over again like a 24-inch python swallowing itself forever. This match is also such a convoluted tale to tell, Brett losing his title to Yokozuna, Hogan appearing at the end to help Brett despite never having been narratively connected to him. Hogan beating Yoko in a match that's also a title match for no reason. It's a weird ass story that always takes long to tell and it's so bleak because WWE self sabotaging its long running storytelling to default to the same guy holding the belt forever is a tale as old as f time. Number four, King Mabel versus Diesel, SummerSlam 95. And so we turn again unto this match. A pimple sat upon the rump of life, an endless chore and tedium to watch, a heatless bore, a tale bereft of strife, a champion no soul would pay to see, a challenger whose greenness begged belief. As SummerSlam comes round once more for me, the coverage of this match bears me much grief. I cursed the sky as Diesel cursed the gent who sat upon his back and left it sore. To visit once again this main event that makes nine minutes feel an hour or more and my resentment thinking now upon it I hope I have expressed within this sonnet. Number three, Bret Hart versus Shawn Michaels Survivor Series 1997. The Montreal Screwjob is the most over-described and over-referenced match in wrestling history. WWE cannot stop rebooking it over and over and over again. Shane McMahon versus Shawn Michaels, Natalia versus Charlotte, CM Punk versus The Undertaker, Mankind versus The Rock, the f***ing year after it happened in 1998. Some people think it's real, some people think it was faked, other companies have ripped it off. Anytime a wrestling list has an extreme sounding title, you could probably make an argument for the Montreal Screwjob being crammed in there somewhere. Reality in wrestling, the Attitude Era, worst matches, most important matches, Vince McMahon in history, WWE, the Monday Night War, the same tiny four-year window of wrestling history that fans and chroniclers alike return to over and over again because the current landscape of WWE washes everything with such a lifeless brush, or at least it has for the vast majority of time I've been making wrestling lists about it. And this match is always in that conversation. Don't get me wrong, the story of the screw job is a fascinating one of ego, of failing upwards, of wrestling's unique blend of reality reality and fiction. It gives its fans a frightening and exciting amount of power. But there's only one story that you can tell and retell endlessly without feeling like you're stuck in a sweat-stained hellscape, and that's Paddington 2. And the culmination of two men being real pissy at each other is absolutely no Paddington 2. Number two, the Royal Rumble match, Royal Rumble 2015. Oh, for f sake. Every January, New Year, old me, old, old, old me. A truth universally acknowledged is that wrestling fans like a moan. The best part about making that statement is that if you feel it doesn't apply to you and you are upset by that, how are you going to let me know without proving me right? Checkmate, dickass. Modern WWE fans have a few key food groups to complain about. Roman Reigns, bad booking, Vince McMahon, favorite stars being buried, WrestleMania plans, the futility of life, and at the center of all of these circles sit two matches, one of which is the Royal Rumble match 2015. All of the resentments in WWE's relationship with its fans swarming around this match like a cloud of bees, but bees that, instead of dying when they sting you, just complain more because now their guts are out, instead of using that as a lesson to stop stinging you, will sting you again because they're cross about their guts being out. I hate this match to the ends of the earth. It sucks, it's mean 
mean-spirited and made liking wrestling harder to do. It's the worst example of my favorite type of match, and every January it finds a way into my brain and I have the bleak task of remembering that more often than not, wrestling doesn't like me very much. Well, that goes double for you, asshole. But what's the second match, Adam? The second match that all modern fandom hates and makes your life bad every single f***ing time it comes up? Why, that would be number one, Triple H versus Roman Reigns, WrestleMania 32. A heartwarming story of triumph over adversity and injustice, Paddington 2 charts the adventures of a small furry creature unfairly being removed from society and the unwanted rise to prominence of an unconvincing actor most famous for being cast as a big dog. Whilst appearing on the outside to be a mindless distraction for children or people unable to relinquish their childhood, Paddington 2 is a surprisingly profound, hilarious, and emotionally powerful work using simple but imaginative, characterful and earnest storytelling to spin a rousing tale of the transformative power of decency and the vitality of family, both domestic and communal. Paddington 2 is a shining example that, if done with care and consistency, any art can be great art, and while sneering at bad art can provide the occasional thrill of a cheap laugh or the wisdom of a lesson learned, the good stories are the one that are the most worth coming back to again and again. And that's our list. F*** off. Yes, I revised for this one. Oh, yeah. I can't go all the way, but I can go some of the way. Oh, ho, ho, ho. A belt that's been retired for 10 years. Absolutely scrumptious.